How's it going ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donahue here once again. This time we're going to take a look at ions and ionic compounds. So our objectives will be to describe the process of ionic bonding and predict the empirical formulas for various ionic compounds. So let's talk about atoms and ions. An atom is when it's neutral. Specifically, it's neutral. You wouldn't really say you have a charged atom because that's not what an atom is. Atoms are neutral because protons equal electrons. Here, I have three protons, which tells me I have a charge of plus three, but I also have these three electrons, which tells me I got a charge of minus three. When I combine those, I get an overall charge of zero. So there's no net charge. Overall, it's neutral. Ions, guess what? That's not the case. Protons don't equal electrons. Maybe this atom lost an electron. Well, if I got rid of an electron, now it's got a positive charge overall because electrons are negative, right? So when protons are greater than the number of electrons, you end up with a positive charge. But atoms could also gain electrons, in which case there's more electrons than protons, and you end up with a negative charge overall. So let's talk about these a little more in depth. So cations have a positive charge because they're losing electrons. So in this example, I have lithium, and it's losing an electron so what's happening to it? Its charge is going up. It becomes a cation. It has a positive charge. The way I remember cations is I, I, I draw a little cat. I think of a little cute little cat with a little nose and it's, you know. So yeah, cations are positive. All right. And they tend to be metals. Metals tend to lose electrons, become positive. Anions are the opposite. So they have a negative charge. Electrons are being gained. So right here we have nine protons, but we also have nine electrons. Well, what would happen if it gained one more electron? It would have a charge of minus one because it gained a negative electron. And these tend to be nonmetals. And the way I remember that is ants. Anions, I just think of little ants, and they're like little minus signs, right? And plus, if an ant shows up to your picnic, it's a bad thing, right? That's, I, that's my ant. <laughs> All right, so how do you predict ionic charges? How do you know what the charge of that atom is going to become when it gains or loses electrons? Well, they tend to gain or lose electrons so they can achieve that group 18, the noble gas configuration. They like having the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So for metals, they tend to lose electrons. So this guy, beryllium, it wants to be like helium. But it has four electrons and helium only has two. So it's going to lose two electrons to end up like helium, all right? Nonmetals, they go in the opposite way. Like fluorine over here, he's like, oh man, I'm almost like neon. I got nine electrons, neon has 10. If only I could get one more electron so I could be like neon. So because that's what it does, it gains electrons, it becomes negatively charged and they, you know, an anion. anion. For each electron gained, we give it a minus one. For each electron lost, it becomes not plus two, that's way wrong, <laughs> plus one for each electron lost. So let's take a look. Magnesium, let's find that on the periodic table. Right here, it's got 12 protons and electrons. It wants to lose them so it can become like neon. It's closest to neon, that only has 10. So Mg is going to lose two electrons, which means its charge is going to become plus two, right? that's going to be the charge of magnesium because it lost these two electrons. Where do they come from? Well, magnesium, when it was neutral, had them. It got rid of them so it could become plus two and have the same number of electrons as neon. What about lithium? All right, well, lithium right here has three electrons. Helium only has two. Piece of cake. Lithium is going to get rid of just one electron so it could be like helium, which means lithium becomes plus one. Chlorine. Let's take a look at chlorine. Chlorine has 17 electrons. It's almost argon. And the way that it can become argon is if it gained one electron. If it gains a negative electron, its charge becomes negative. Right? And then oxygen, well, here's oxygen. It wants to become like neon because it's closest to neon. Well, it needs to gain two electrons, which means its charge is going to become minus two. That's how you predict the ionic charges. So there's a pattern, right? So lithium, if it wants to become helium, it has to lose one electron. So it becomes plus one charged. Sodium is in the same situation as lithium. 
it's one away from becoming like neon. So everything in this group is going to end up with a plus one charge. Everything in this group is going to end up with a plus two charge. And then fluorine, everything in fluorine's group is going to become, oh, it has seven, so it wants to gain one, becomes minus one. Group 16, it's going to become minus two. Group 15, it's going to become minus three. And those guys in the middle, we're not going to worry about them. We're not going to talk about them. Ignore them. Transition metals, it gets messy. It's not nice like this. Uh, so that's a whole other video. So ionic compounds. Where are the electrons going when they're lost? You know, you're saying these things are losing electrons. Where do the electrons go? You're also saying that other things are gaining electrons. Where are they coming from? Where are they getting these electrons? You guys, seeing a pattern here? They happen simultaneously. So as one atom loses an electron, another atom's going to gain it, right? So now these ions, right? If this lithium here lost one electron, it became plus one charged. And then if this atom over here, I think is fluorine, it gained one. It becomes minus one charged. What's going to happen? Well, I know that opposites attract and they're going to form this bond. We call that an ionic bond. They're forming an ionic compound. Right, so ionic compounds are formed when atoms transfer electrons, becoming charged, and then attracted to each other, because opposites attract. Oppositely charged particles are attracted to each other. Typically, these form when a metal and a nonmetal bond together. Right, so here we have lithium, which is a metal, right? And we have fluorine down here, which is a nonmetal. So when they interact with each other, they tend to form ionic bonds. So yeah, like I said, lithium is going to lose one electron, right? It's going to leave and it becomes plus one. Fluorine is then going to gain that electron, become minus one. And now they're attracted to each other and that's an ionic compound. That's ionic bond. So this compound is going to be called LIF or lithium fluoride. But it is important, this is not a molecule. You're never going to say a molecule of lithium fluoride because molecules aren't ionically bonded. So if we take a look at ionic compounds, there's no discrete molecules, right? If I have lithium here and I have fluorine here, but they're charged. The question is, all right, well, which, which fluorine is this lithium bonded to? And it's kind of a nonsense question because it's both of them. It's attracted to both but there's no bond keeping them. They're not stuck together. You know, if they were to break apart, this lithium could break apart with that fluorine or that fluorine. There's no distinct molecules. So when we end up with ionic compounds, we only have an empirical formula to describe it. Now this, what's shown on the picture is we have two lithium and two fluorine, but that's not an empirical formula, right? Oh, that's we got to give the simplest one. So it's just going to be LIF and that would be the empirical formula for lithium fluoride. So how are we going to pre predict these empirical formulas? Well, we know that ionic compounds need to have a net charge of zero. Overall, their charge has to be neutral. So positive charges need to be neutralized by negative charges. And here I got an example of magnesium, which is going to become plus two, and nitride, which is minus three. How am I going to get those to balance out? So you got, yeah, how are we going to get two and three to cancel each other out? Where you're going to go is you're going to go, all right, what? Can I, I can count by twos, I can count by threes. How am I going to meet in the middle? What number do they have in common? Or you can do this swap and simplify method. First step, you look at the charge on the anion and make it the subscript for the cation. So anion has a charge of minus three. I take that three, I make it the subscript for magnesium. It's saying I'm going to need three magnesium. And then I do the same thing for the cation. I go, all right, hey, there's a two here. I'm going to put it as a subscript for nitrogen. I'm going to need two of those. Right, And then you can simplify if you can. Here I got three and two. There's no common factors for that. So my empirical formula is going to be three magnesium and two nitrogen or Mg3N2. Well, what happens? Let's, let's check it. So I know each magnesium is plus two. So that means I got plus six from those three magnesium. Each nitrogen is minus three and there's two of them. So I end up with minus six from those two nitrogen. And hey, wouldn't you know it? Overall charge is zero. Bam! Empirical formula. So, do a little practice. Pause it. I dare you. Try it. Do it. Try it. And then unpause when you're ready. All right, cool. Let's take a look. Sodium is in group one, so it wants to lose one electron. It's going to become plus one. 
Chlorine is in group 17. It wants to gain one electron, so it's going to be minus one. So I can do the swap and simplify, and I just end up with NaCl, and I can check. It's plus one, and minus one gives me an overall charge of zero. Awesome. That's my empirical formula for sodium chloride. K and S. Well, let me find potassium. Boom. Potassium is also in group one. It's going to become plus one. It wants to lose one electron. Sulfur, group 16. It wants to gain two electrons. So I'm going to end up with a minus two. So I can do the swap and simplify again. I end up with K2S and I can't simplify it anymore. That is my empirical formula. And I can check each potassium is plus one. There's two of them. So I end up with a plus two. Each sulfur is minus two. There's one of them. So I end up with minus two. Overall charge is zero. So let's take a look at Mg and O. Mg is in group two. So it's going to lose one, two electrons. So it ends up looking like neon. So it's going to be plus two. Oxygen is in group 16. It's going to want to gain two electrons. It's going to be minus two. Now watch how you got to remember to simplify. If I do this swap, I end up with Mg two. O2. But I can simplify that. All right, 2 and 2 can be divided by 2 and I just end up with an empirical formula of MgO. Or OMG, right? No, it's MgO. You always put the positive thing first, so it's MgO. Sorry. First your bubble. So summarize, can you describe what is meant by anions, cations, and describe the process of ionic bonding? Can you predict ionic charges for each element? And can you determine the empirical formula for ionic compounds? I sure hope so. Uh, if not, that, that's a shame. And uh, I'll see you in class. Okay, bye.